Today, I'm with Karen Creven, CEO at the Active Wellbeing Society in the UK. The Active Wellbeing Society works to develop healthy, happy communities, living active and connected lives. I think Karen's been in the job for about three years since the cooperative was established. And um, yeah, the Active Wellbeing Society works um, obviously to improve well-being, but really focuses on um, the most deprived citizens in Birmingham. Uh, and previous to this, Karen worked for Birmingham City Council um, as their head of community sport and healthy lifestyle for about 15 years. And one of the programmes uh, Karen led was overseeing the award winning Be Active scheme, which was the UK's, or it might still be, the largest public health programme. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later. Karen's also worked as a homeless youth service manager for three years. And Karen was on the board of Street Games and is currently a committee member at Sports England. So I'm really pleased today to welcome Karen. How are you going, Karen? I'm good, thank you. Very good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Just just coming to the end of my day today, and obviously it's it's early mornings for you, early morning there for you. What's it What's it like in the UK? Oh, it's it's one of those November days where we don't get a lot of light. So <laughs> I'm I, the lights are still on. The kids are going off to school. I can they're seeing I'm seeing them walk past my window, but the lights in people's houses are still on. It's a bit of a grim day today. A bit of a one of those days to stay inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'll jump straight into it. Um, so, what does well-being mean to you? I think for me, I, I suppose where I start is um, some of the traditional models around well-being. It's about shelter, it's about mm. um, security, and it's about kinship, and it's about health. You know, it's all the elements that that kind of leave us as humans functioning at our uh, most effective and our, our best. Um, and I suppose most importantly for me within all of that is our ability to move. As humans, we're designed to move right from birth. You know, as soon as we come out, we're there ready to get going. So there's something for me about making sure that we've got all the conditions in place to be our best selves, um, but particularly in, in relation to movement and getting out and about and being us. Yeah, yeah, that, that movement um, piece is obviously very important. But you're actually the first one to mention um, shelter um, when, when oh. we talk about well-being. So that's really interesting because you think about the social determinants of health and, and you know, what, what's important for communities. Obviously, having shelter is, is, is a fundamental thing, isn't it, to, to being well? Well, it's Maslow's hierarchy of need for me. You know, if, yeah. you, if you've got shelter and food yeah. and warmth, security then you then you can get onto that self-actualization you know that being your best self your sense of social agency yeah. what, you know, what can you do to change your environment and i think without those fundamental pillars of you know warmth and shelter and security and, and love as well actually you, you don't get to to do some of the more um, cerebral things so yeah shelter is really important and it's one of the things we see a lot in in birmingham in, and in the uk generally you know the housing shortage housing crisis means that there are a lot of people sleeping rough they never get past that sense of of insecurity to then really focus on on being their best selves and their health deteriorates as a result and we've done some fantastic projects actually with um young homeless people trying to get them a bit more secure a bit more active and yeah. also help kind of get them ready for their own tenancies so stuff you know i definitely think there's a role for the sector in supporting people around shelter for sure Mm, yeah, and I think a byproduct of obviously being on the streets, I think mental health is is, is huge, isn't it? So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. And in terms of your well-being, then, what do you do to, to keep that in check? Well, I used to be a runner, not that, not that I've got the body for it anymore. Menopause um, slapped me around the face. But um, <laughs> and now I'm perfectly designed for throwing myself in very cold rivers. So I do that ah. several times. Week. I get up in early in the morning and I go and throw myself in a river um, and just commune with nature and some swans. There's always a pair of swans. Um, I love it. I mean, it's, it, it's my sanity. A bit of cold water and I'm happy. Absolutely. Is, is that the Winhof method, is it? The what? The what? Do you have What's that? A Winhof always is a guy who, um, yeah, he's, he's really... I suppose brought to market around cold water, ice, and you know the benefits of all that for the body. You know, I, I think yeah, there's, there's yeah. some great benefits for the immune system, and you know, totally. gen, yeah, just general well-being. So, how does that work then? So, you know, people will be just walking down the street, and you'll be just, you know, in the river having a swim next to some swans. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. I mean, I swim in either a swimming costume or or naked. Right. And uh, I have a bubble hat on in the winter because obviously your head gets cold. Yeah. Um, and a pair of wetsuit boots and a pair of wetsuit gloves because your extremities get really cold. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah just get in the water swim i love it if you swim at sunrise that's when it when it, when the kind of atmosphere is at its best yeah nice. and for me for me it's it's a beautiful it's a lovely physical experience you know you've mm. got the cold water you i swim against the current to start with so i'm pushing against nature to start with and then i let her bring me back down the river on the way back um so you get a physical workout but you also get this amazing sort of sense of of communing with nature you know mm. I, I often I'll turn over onto my back as I'm coming back down the river and I'm looking at the sky and I'm watching the birds and the trees hanging over the river and that just that sense of being at one with something that's been there for thousands and thousands of years you yeah. know it's kind of my, my church if you like yeah. so I, I mean I can't stop smiling just talking about it I absolutely love it and there's if, if you follow me on Facebook there's hundreds of before and after photographs where I'm getting in the river looking bloody grumpy and I'm getting out radiating with this smile it's just it's so good for me and i have i have actually broken ice to swim which was the most ex amazing experience yeah wow really good. so when you I really recommend it. yeah so when you feel like things are maybe getting a bit on top of you you just look for the closest river to you and then you know just, totally. to, just to sort yeah. yourself. i build it into my week so that i because I, I know when i when if i don't swim after a few days i start to get a bit tetchy yeah so. have, you ever, have you ever swam in the river weir up in the northeast of england I haven't, but I've, it's on my list, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Good stuff. OK, so just uh, in terms of the Active Wellbeing Society, uh, which are, you know, a, a terrific organisation. And I think the first time I spoke to you, I was like, I think I found my tribe. <laughs> um, can you just, yeah, give us a little bit more, um, yeah, a bit of background about the work that you do and where, where you guys are in the health and wellness system? Sure. Well, firstly, I just want to say, uh, definitely, you've, we've definitely found tribes with each other for sure. And what's lovely is that, that that's international. You know, it's great to know that there are people in other parts of the world working on stuff the same as yourselves. It's such a it's such a affirming experience. In terms of the Active Wellbeing Society, we're a cooperative. We um, are a community benefit society as well, which is a particular type of governance that means that any profits that we make or any surplus that we make gets returned to the community, um, and they control where where that goes. So we've got a process process for um, reallocating money back into the community. Um, we've got a membership that's based um, in our participants and our staff um, and the work that we do um, started when we were back in the council because we took some of these services out of the council mm -hmm. and the work that we do um, centred um, initially around physical activity, free physical activity interventions. So we were, um, as, you, as you said in your introduction, we had the Be Active scheme, which was a whole um, free um, intervention in leisure centres right across the city. Even today, there's a free physical activity offer for citizens. The only criteria is that you live in the city and then you can go and do to swim, gymming, or gym or fitness classes but absolutely for free at some point during the day um, right across the city and all our other centres. And we even negotiated that into our private ones. So that was great. But then we do a whole lot of stuff outside. So um, we've got an active parks programme where we take a whole lot of activities and put them on for free in parks um, and, and open spaces. And that is ranges from things like uh, Tai Chi and Pilates through to walking groups, through to sort of fitness classes, that kind of stuff. And how um, many, because I remember you saying bikes you gave away. How many bikes did you give away? That's right. So we've got a free bike initiative um, where we um, worked um, with the Department for Transport. We got enough funding for 5,000 bikes and we gave them away to citizens and deprived postcodes on the basis that they needed to be um, prepared to have a tracker on their bike so that we could see that it was being used. Um, and they needed to use it at least once a week for the first six months. And as long as they did that, then at the end of the six months, we wrote off the capital requirement within the council and the bike became theirs. So the first six months, it was the city council's bike. Once they demonstrated that they were using it regularly, um, we passed it on to them and they've kept their bikes. And that was that was as a result of some early prototyping work. We'd done lending people bikes. Mm. Um, and Although people got into cycling, it didn't change their personal circumstances. They still weren't any richer to be able to afford the bike. So we managed to get a scheme where we could pass the bikes on at the end of the capital write-off period, which has been great. Um, there are now 7,000 bikes out there in the city. Um, and we are working with Essex, a county in England, to um, do a similar scheme in Essex. And we're looking as part of the Commonwealth Games legacy to be able to roll out free bikes right across the entire West Midlands region where the Commonwealth Games in 2022 will be held. So that's all very exciting. Wow. And if, you, if you ever you come to Birmingham, you'll spot our orange bikes. They're, um, they're around the city. There's people out on them today. It's all I can do not to stop them and ask them their story because I still get really excited when I see them. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's just incredible. Um, I, I love it. And 
it's a, it's a great demonstration of proportionate universalism in action, isn't it? You know, um, yeah. you know, trying to provide. Well, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, absolutely. And in our city, I mean, we've got 1.1 million people living in Birmingham. 408,000 of them live in the top 10% most deprived households in the country. Wow. So I'll just say that again, 408,000 people in my city live in the top 10% most deprived households in the UK. So that means poverty in Birmingham is a really significant barrier. Mm. So we've had to think about schemes that remove cost as a barrier. Mm. So that's why all our activities are free. We put them on in the most deprived parts of the city or we'll, you know, the criteria for coming for the bikes, for example, was that you had to live within a deprived postcode. And the idea using Marmot's proportionate universalism is that you design it in such a way so that the ones that need to to use it the most are able to come or the ones that benefit from it the most are able to receive the service so it, it's working really well and we've been able to show that trajectory of use is from um, our most deprived communities which are the ones that aren't normally exercising the most so we really have been able to demonstrate that it works um, and at some scale for the you know for, for England. Yeah and with um, Sir Michael Marmot and the, I suppose his kind of philosophy uh, you know, around providing the most support to those most in need, but kind of everybody gets something. So, Absolutely. you know, that I think that's the, the key piece, isn't it? Because um, if you were just giving it to the poor, you know, the poor or people from deprived areas, that's that wouldn't be a great system, really. So um, yes. how is that? How has that worked with, you know, maybe people with who've got a, you know, a bit more of an income and they're a bit more steady? Um, has that been the bikes for, as we're talking about it being rolled out to some of those communities as well? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think if you set up a scheme that's just for people who are poor or just for people who are ill or whatever, it's really stigmatising. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of research from the World Health Organisation that supports that, actually. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've tried to do is make sure that boundaries are quite porous. So by that, what I mean is you know, when we're putting on activities um, in a deprived part of the city, for example, there's no criteria other than, um, you know, that the, then you turn up, it's free. So we're putting it on somewhere where poor people live, but yeah. that doesn't mean that it's that only the, the people most immediately can come. But what the research showed was that um, certainly for us in Birmingham, the poorer you are, the more likely you were to stay within a smaller radius of the city. Right. So if we're putting stuff locally for you, chances are yeah. you're going to be much more able to come. That doesn't stop other people in the city from jumping in their car or jumping on a, a bus or whatever and coming across. And we do see quite a good social mix. So, you know, like something like 70% of our, um, of our footfall will be from the people in the most deprived um, households. But that means that 30% isn't. And, and often what we see is people who are on shifts or people um, who just, um, you know, who face other barriers. Maybe that's it's about community networks or maybe it's just about time are able to use our interventions. And certainly with the bikes, we because we did it on a postcode basis, actually you might live in a poor postcode but have a job and, and, have, and have some mm -hmm. income. So it didn't preclude people who had a bit more income. But what it did was it made it made having a go at exercise risk free. So even if you've got some income, if you're not if you're not sure you're going to like it, you might not want to commit cash resources to it. You might have a whole load of things that are calling on your cash reserves other than physical activity. So if you can go and have a go at it for free, it reduces the risk of you um, losing money. So even for people who aren't really poor, sometimes that's a barrier. So it, it's it's actually meant that people can go and have a go at something they can try it and what we've seen is that people who can afford it then take themselves out into the different markets so certainly with the gym if people come and they try it for free they mm. get into it they realize they like it and then they go off and join a gym mm. and that was really important because what we didn't want to do was undermine the paid for gym um, situation in the city and actually what we've seen is that a rising tide gathers all boats so as people <laughs> have had the opportunity to have a go at it for free they've realized they like it but then they can place themselves in the market and yeah what they can afford so if you're really poor there's an offer for you in our in our leisure centers that's always free but actually if you've got a bit more disposable income there's all these wonderful gyms you can take yourself off to and they've benefited as a result as well yeah that's a that's a really great outcome isn't it that because i was going to ask the question and i will ask it you know some people might look at schemes like this and think well you know that's not fair why are you giving this money to this certain group you know they need to you know get it get off the bum and get a job or whatever and it's sure. it's obviously never as black and white as that um but yeah how how has it been perceived uh you know within i suppose birmingham and then i suppose like politically uh you know because because leisure centers for example they cost a lot of money to run so yeah how how is how is that all worked out really interesting isn't it i mean I'm, i've got the benefit of seeing a national perspective a lot of the time as well with my mm. work with sport with sport 
And one of the saddest um, sessions I think I ever had was a presentation from a from a leisure provider. I won't name names, but they were basically talking about their model. And they were saying that for, for them, the optimum efficiency is for nearly 30 percent of their gym members to not ever come. Now, we've all been there. I've had gym memberships and then not turned up for six months, but I've still been paying. You know, yeah. you get locked into a contract. And that was their, they were saying that that's their most efficient model. But as Sport England, I'm sitting there listening to that, knowing that our targets are about getting people more active. So, you know, they might not come and that might be a really efficient way to run a, a you know, a leisure sector, but yeah. it's not meeting our national requirements, which is about getting people as active as we can. So there's something for me about making sure that we're not designing in inefficiency into our models, you know, mm. economically. But your point about jobs is really interesting because one of the things that we're really clear about is that r- regular physical activity has a really important role to play in, in self-esteem and self-confidence and ultimately in job readiness. So some of the people, you know, who are, who are, um, you know, who are living perhaps slightly chaotic lives, you know, in and out of poverty or in and out of um, a whole range of factors that might lead to poverty. Actually, the regular discipline of exercise is really helpful. Yeah. As well as that, the people who are at the bottom of the pile um, economically are also the ones that are often the biggest expense to the system. So they're the ones that aren't living the healthiest lives. They're the ones that get sicker earlier. They're the ones that have, live with long term conditions. So they cost the state money and sounding really hard nosed, which I don't really like to do as that often, but sounding really really hard nosed in terms of the bang for the citizens buck if you spend money on the people who are inactive you get the, the you get the return because they end up costing the system less actually so there's something about you improving people's lives you're making them more likely to be job ready we know people have told us that on the back of being given a free bike they've gone and got jobs not least about 30 women and um, black women in a part of birmingham called hansworth it was a result of getting their free, their bikes. They couldn't ride and they didn't have jobs. But as a result of being taught to ride bikes and being given free bikes, they now teach bikeability, which is our <laughs> learning to ride program. They now teach that in schools to kids from their communities. Now, if that's not a perfect circle, that exercise has stimulated them, what is? You know, unemployed women who couldn't ride bikes, being taught to ride bikes, being given bikes, and now training kids where they can say to the kids, well, five years ago, I couldn't ride a bike either. You know, in their own community languages, you know, being role models for their community i mean it doesn't get better than that in my book so yeah it does might feel counterintuitive but it but the evidence all shows that this is better for everyone in society if we're bringing the the people right at the bottom up with us you know so uh, i couldn't agree more with what you just said there that was fantastic and you know it just shows you by giving a community a bike like the social impact there the ripple effect you know that you that you can have that's a real systems type of um in, intersection you know by yeah. you know just nudging it a little bit and then how it can all you know have that ripple effect but you talk about the health burden and you know it, it all makes sense you know because if we can get people active particularly from those socioeconomic areas then you know it's going to save us down the track and um best bang for our book as you said but how come we can't tell that story or get that through government you know you what you're doing is in in birmingham sounds like it's pioneering you know like and you obviously wanted to spread this out to the west midlands or midlands um i know we're in COVID at the moment and it's kind of a different world um but yeah what's how can we try and influence or you know change kind of the system as it is at the moment well, my, my attitude is um, is to pilot and to de- and prototype and to demonstrate that it works mm. and to collect evidence. You know, one of the things that we've been really good at, um, because I was uh, informed really early days by my public health colleagues here, is to is to make sure we collect the evidence. So we have got a wealth of data that shows time and time and time again that if you do these interventions in this way, mm. you get in the people from the communities you're trying to attract, and and it's you know there's there's all sorts of ways, aren't there? You know, allies politically, getting the message out, all that sort of stuff. But it all starts with having the evidence. Mm-hmm. You know, without that evidence, you know, you're you're just trying to influence the wind, as it were. Um, so for me, the important bit is demonstrating that it works by gathering the evidence. But then it's about making the case in a robust way. And we've got some great advocates here in the UK that are doing that. You know, people like William Bird and others. Um, you know, street games are a really good example of that too. You mentioned them earlier. And Sport England themselves are really clear that one of the things one of the one of the ways that they need to demonstrate success 
in terms of their role as Sport England is to is to be tackling and reducing inequalities. So a clear government agenda around that's you know always a good start. Um, and then it's about being able to demonstrate the success. And I, you know, without wanting to sound too harsh to the leisure sector, I don't always think we've been great at collecting evidence. You know, this in 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 England, we mm. still meet evidence for people who don't want to collect ethnicity data. It's that like if you're not collecting the data, you can't show that you're having the impact. So there's something about the sector becoming more mature, understanding that it's got a wider range of strategic outcomes that it can demonstrate, and then being being prepared and able to collect that evidence to show that we really are part of the solution. You know, and in these complex times, actually what you need is are, are a range of solutions, which is great news for the leisure sector. You know, we should be in there showing that we can make a difference to the quality of people's lives. And one of the things that we've been doing over the last few years is really trying to show the impact of community cohesion that mm -hmm. bringing people together for physical activity has, not least in times where we're being asked to be so isolated from each other. Yeah. So there's something for me about, you know, understanding what we're trying to do, understanding the story we're trying to tell, having the evidence to show that we're doing it, and then looking for those advocates at senior levels, you know, nationally and internationally, that can tell the story with us. That said, the best thing that you can ever do, I think, is take a decision maker into a community to see it firsthand. You know, mm. the, it, hear from the people themselves the difference that the interventions are making to their lives. You know, that the smiles, the kind of, do you know, what I mean? the story, the personal stories leaves yeah. no, leaves every politician slightly humbled. So it's great. You know, a, a, a mix of ways of doing it, but definitely for me, there's a challenge back to the sector to say, come on, let's let's be really upfront about what we're what what difference we can actually make when we when we can. Share Show that we're co we're contributing to the wider human experience so much more positively. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've done it very well, telling that story, gathering that data. You know, being able to uh, you know showcase the work that you've done. What are some of the successes around the the health um, kind of um, impact that you've had? Have you been able to quantify? You know how much. You've reduced the, the health burden, for example, with the Be Active scheme with 400,000 yeah. people being on there, you know, involved in, in, in it. <clears throat> yeah, no, absolutely. When we've had some independent work done on um, some independent evaluation done by academics and by um, economists on the Be Active scheme. Mm. And they concluded that for every pound, which is our, our currency unit, for every pound that's spent um, in England on, on, on a scheme like ours, it benefits £17.23 into the system. So that's 17 pounds for every one pound spent. And the the main, the bulk of that is health gain. So, you know, we will be saving on diseases that people won't get. We will be saving on reduced medication that people require, you know, diabetes, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's so much evidence now that being regularly physically active, you know, either prevents or reduces the impact of a whole load of, of lifestyle type conditions. Um, so there's 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 about I think in this in the um, in the 17 pounds worth it worth of benefit that's all health yeah. overall system it's about 21 pounds worth of benefit because there are other things that you that you gain inc including days lost to sickness for employees you know th really basic things like that so there's um, and we're not the only scheme physical yeah. activity scheme that's been able to demonstrate that sort of benefit you know good cost benefit analysis can show you that actually by spending money in this way the that you know nationally and locally you save money in the long yeah. run yeah yeah it makes sense i mean that's such a high figure like wow because i think sports england put, put out some data around it was you know for every pound it was maybe seven dollars or whatever but if you're obviously looking working in more deprived communities then that that benefit would be even greater so absolutely we get a real amplification you see of the benefit because you're working with people who are doing nothing you yeah know, get, take somebody from doing nothing to doing something yeah is the, is the area where you have the biggest impact mm. actually yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. And then there's the wider benefits, you know, maybe educational attainment or subjective well-being and community cohesion. So, yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me as well is really interesting is, is in terms of citizenship. Mm. So you know, we, know, we know that over and over again, if you're poor, your ability to choose is restricted. Mm. And actually your, your decision making processes, your choice criteria get a less used so mm. you know consistently all the evidence shows that the poorer you are the less likely you are to feel like you can choose anything different you know you, your your sense of purpose your sense of agency is mm. diminished freedom um, maybe absolutely recently. yeah absolutely yeah. now one of the amazing things about sport and physical activity is is the mastery you know when you learn a new technique when you learn a new <laughs> skill 
it increases your self confidence. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That sort of like, yeah, I've done it. You know. <laughs> So, so, so that that then works to counterbalance some of the impact of poverty. And what we're seeing yeah. over and over again, and we're beginning to be able to demonstrate this with some of the data and evidence we've collected, is that actually getting involved in physical activity at a very local level with people like yourself, you know, mm. like your own your own tribe, as you described mm. this morning, with people like me, you know, if you if you then master a skill, it increases your sense of agency mm. and ability to influence the outcomes of your life. Mm. And that has an impact right across your life makes you more likely to think about going back to college and mm. training it makes you more likely to think that you can move house and sort stuff out you know it just creates um like a counterbalance to that sense of dependency that gets generated by being poor yeah it's that can it's a, that, go on i was just saying it's connection and um hearing what you're saying there I, I was brought up in germany went there when i was five years old and couldn't speak german went to a german school you know i was like oh what's going on felt really out of, out of place but you know football kind of was that common language and sure. yeah it was the it was the one thing that kind of integrated me in the community and it's the kind of same analogy yeah. isn't it mm. it is it is and i think and you know it's not to be underestimated you know some of the some of the skills, some of the attributes that we need people into private communities to be able to practice to get themselves out of that poverty actually mm. can be taught through sport and physical activity and that connection with other people. You know, understanding that other people feel the same or watching somebody else achieve something inspires you to do it. You know, it's not to be underestimated. And I think for too long we've hid our light under a bushel a little bit with, with sport and physical activity. You know, we've not been seeing from the rafters enough about the role that it can play in terms of making society a better place. And I just think, you know, certainly we've we've been doing a lot recently to to, de to try and demonstrate the sort of wider civic benefits of mm. physical activity. The argument's well made around health, absolutely, but there are economic benefits, there are community cohesion benefits. You know, there's there are there is just a wider community benefit to getting people to be active together. It's you know, and 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 it's really important that we're able to articulate the economic value of that. Yeah, absolutely, because that speaks into the hearing of politicians, doesn't it? Uh, it's just that that's maybe a bit further down the track. And but because I hear a lot about new, you know, when the wellness movement, you know, health, we need a health service. And, you know, do you think we're at a time where things are going to change? Or do you think we're all just, you know, banging on the drum and saying the same things? And it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be the same you know outcomes or yeah yeah I don't know so I mean you and I just before we started this we're just having a quick chat about you know the difference in sort of the the impact of COVID for example yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I would say internationally we're living in in what in uncertain times mm. and there is a tipping point coming if we're not at it already and mm. um, the environment is a big issue you know the world economic model has shifted and um, power shifts with it you know, I do think we're 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 um, we're sort we're in changing times. Mm. I think I think though there are some constants. You know, and if you look back at human human experience, you know, being physically well and 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 able to um, you know to play and to um, you know to move mm -hmm. are are key in all civilizations. You know, throughout time, I think there'll be another version of physical activity. There'll be um, you know, there'll be other approaches. But I do think the penny is dropping for some of the countries about, you know, actually, if we want citizens to do things, then we need to create environments to enable them to do it. You know, there, mm. we've actually in our urban environments, we've actually built in um, a lack of physical activity. You know, we've, we've designed out the need to be as active. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think we've realized the implications of that. Mm. So I see a lot. I see a lot going on internationally about active environments, you know, mm -hmm. using space, using our civic space to provoke people to, you know, to be more active. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I think that inevitably we'll have to use our finite resources as a, as a planet um, much more intentionally. And I'm really hopeful that within that will be um, a kind of a consensus around the importance of of working together to, pro to provoke people to be as active and as connected as they can be. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right about designing exercise out of our lives. We've lost a lot of that incidental exercise. And we get Uber Eats and we're not cooking as much or, you know, not even getting up and pressing the remote for the, the, the you know, pressing the TV. You've got a remote now. I know, I know that's that was maybe 10 years ago, but that's just a, an example. Um, but yeah, well-being, I think, is becoming more and more important for, for you know, for government and communities, etc. So. <laughs> Um, we've come to my last question. I can't believe it. It's gone so quickly. <laughs> uh, so in terms of um, you personally, where do you see yourself in the system? And 
uh, how you contribute and influence it. Sure. I mean, I think we would like to think as, um, as the Active Wellbeing Society that we're, uh, we're a strong sort of regional player. You know, we, we're based in Birmingham. We work across the Midlands. We do some work in, in other parts of the country. Mm. We've influenced part of the debate nationally as we've progressed and, and we, we, we like to play a, a part in that. I think that um, personally, I'd like to see myself as a bit of a, pro a provocation to the system sometimes. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't a, sp a sports professional. I didn't come from that tradition. I was actually a probation officer and, and um, you know, I'm much more interested in, in what makes people tick than I am yeah. at anything else. But I do understand the transformative power of sport and physical mm. activity. And I'd like to see myself as an advocate for the sector, really. Mm. I think that there is some, there, we have such exciting contributions um, as, as humans to make to each other's lives. And for me, um, you know, that, that, you know, when you come together to do, whether it's a swim or a run, or even if it's, you know, I realised actually when I was a runner, that it was just a fast demonstration. You know, I used to go on loads of demos when I was a student. And I suddenly realised that when I was out on a, you know, on a mass participation event, it was like a, a quick demo, you know. I was suddenly around loads of people who, like me, wanted to do that same wacky thing on a Sunday morning. So there's something for me, I guess, about wanting to play my part in society, mm. um, but also but also not being afraid to, to challenge, because I think that's how change happens. Mm. Um, we're, I'm, I'm always keen to learn. And what's lovely about talking to people like yourself on a, on a miserable Tuesday morning in, in Britain, do you know what I mean? It's just, suddenly your world opens back out and you think, mm. actually, there are people other parts of the world also trying mm. to tackle these same things. So I love that connection. And, I, and I'm striving all the time, I guess, to build connections um, between sport, physical activity, well-being, what we do um, to, to other agendas and to other parts of the world so I'd like to see myself I guess as somebody who just played their bit in society mm -hmm. um, and certainly our, our organization is one that just tries to make sure that it leaves the world a better place at the end of the day than when it started so I don't know if that totally answers your question but um but yeah I mean you know and, and if you've got any more questions throw them in <laughs> no, no 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 I know we're at the end I could talk to you all day David it's lovely to speak to you and to imagine where you're sitting as you're asking me these as well <laughs> Yeah, no, we always have a good chat, don't we? I think um, there's definitely a lot of commonalities there. But I think what comes through for me is uh, you definitely don't come across as somebody who's not frightened to say what you think. And I think that's 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 really important when you you know everybody's got <coughs> different perspectives. And you know, I think it's great that you're involved with Sports England, and you know, you've been involved with street games for a long time. But uh, it's definitely you know that that kind of uh, systems approach working together with all these different organizations and yeah you've got the runs on the board for sure with uh, all the work that's been happening in Birmingham I think it's just it needs to be scaled and because it is one of the 12 Sports England delivery pro pilots right. isn't it yeah yeah how yeah. How, how 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 many um I'm gonna have to ask you one more question how many no, years no, how many no, years no. does that does that last for like when's that no. We've done two already and we've got at least another two years funding. Yeah. So, uh, and, and because we're Birmingham, I think the, the reality is the legacy from the Commonwealth Games period will mean that we'll be able to take the work that we've been doing during this time and roll it into what will be the regional legacy, which is which is great from a, you know, from a kind of st strategic point of view. Mm. Um, yeah, no, it's and, and it's and it's been such a privilege to be part of that innovation pilot. You know, we've mm. we've we've basically been given permission to to try things out and see if they work. And mm. you know, you don't often get that opportunity in the public sector. Mm. You know, you're, you're often a little bit more hemmed in by sort of you know being able to demonstrate that it's already going to work before you start. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful to work around innovation in in that way. Mm. Um, and you know, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to roll in the learning into the Commonwealth Games, and the legacy will go beyond that. And then we'll have and then we'll have had enough time to really change the foundations of things. You know, you talked before about system change. You know, I, I'm hoping um, and, and we're beginning to see some early evidence that we're making a little mm. bit of progress on this, that actually we'll be able to change the system that, that around what we're doing enough so that, that things will, um, you know, things will continue on that trajectory going forwards. And when you look at countries that are really good at physical activity at, at population levels, places like Denmark and some of the other places um, in, in sort of Scandinavia and stuff where their activity levels are much higher. Mm. That's what they've done. You know, they've, they've spent 20, 30, 40 years embedded a culture around an expectation of physical activity and in fact in fact Denmark um, you know 60 years ago had 80% of its population not being regularly um, regularly physically active um, they invested a 
lot in the sort in the sort of strategy and mm. they flip that so that now they've only got 20 percent of their population not being regularly physically active and in denmark if you want to set up a club the you know the government if there's more than three of you that want to do an activity the government will fund you to do it um, they pay a lot more tax in in denmark yeah. but actually look, they've designed and they've designed their infrastructure to to support and promote physical activity and it does work but it's taken them you know 50 plus years to get to that point you know we're at such an early point really in birmingham we've been doing our free work now um, and the way that we've been working we've probably been doing that about 11 years but we've seen real demonstrable change as a result and so having this investment from sport england you know being able to continue to work in this way you know i think it's really positive you know we, if we get to 15 20 years of doing it like this then that's a generation of people who've come to expect access to free physical activity and to go back to your point in one of your questions earlier you know i'm hopeful that eventually our national health service will include an element of of, of free exercise as part of that bit about being well and being mm. healthy you yeah. know if we could get to that point i'd be really happy i could I'm retire <laughs> And you boot up and then you can just swim in rivers as, as much as you want. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Uh, fantastic. Well, um, I think that brings us to the end. So I just wanted to thank you. Really appreciate the, the time you, for this morning and uh, my evening. It's um, yeah, it's been it's been great to chat to you as always. Is there anything else that you'd, you'd like to add? I would want to say thank you to you and I'd want to say keep up the great work that you're doing there. We, we've been through the journey that you're on. You just have to keep making the argument. Be brave, you know, which I know you are. You're a fantastic man and a great advocate for the work that you're doing. Um, and it's really exciting to see it emerge. So good luck with it all. Yeah, fan fantastic. And thanks for all the support. So, OK, Karen, well, all the best for the rest of the year and um, have a great day today. And uh, yeah, I'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, my love. Take care. See ya. Bye bye.